Alrighty. This this is a, a very formal session, as you can imagine. Uh, well, no... I think we have to open the meeting first. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes, yes. Okay. Would anyone move to open the meeting? <laughs> move, move in, not out. Someone second it. Uh, yeah. The basic idea of the whole session is to look at the different ways that we make a standard to Ethereum. Is there are different bits of the puzzle, different approaches to doing it. What are we doing in each place? How does it work? What do we like about each approach? And what can we learn? Because each place has different constraints and different factors that influence what you actually can do in that environment. Um, so, I'm going to say who we are. I'm Charles, uh, actually get paid by Pegasus, but to all intents and purposes, I work for the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. My job is making sure that the standard stuff there works. Uh, Dan Burnett, um, I've been doing web and internet standards for about 20 years. I got a dozen specs to my name uh, there. Um, Currently working on decentralized identifiers at W3C. Some of you may have heard of that, you may not have. Um, I am in the uh, yeah. Um, I'm in the Pegasus uh, standards group within Consensus. I'm Charles as well. I work with the Maker Foundation, and we've been doing some research on improvement proposals in general and what's the best to keep in consideration when um, looking at something to implement and taking from all the other programs that you've all worked on. Hi, my name is Jory Burson. Um, I am new to Ethereum. I come to you from the land of JavaScript, uh, where I work on TC39, uh, which is the standards body that uh, sets the standard for the language. Um, I also work with a number of different open source and standards communities. Notably, the one I'm going to talk to you today about uh, is Oasis. And the new project that we have with Ethereum. So I'm excited to share and learn. Uh, I'm Nick Johnson, uh, lead for ENS, the Ethereum name service, and is it for coming for here in the EIP editor. Cool. Actually, uh, slightly more informal than some of the other There we go. Cool. Oh, I am away. No. Yeah, so, um, you know, we. I'm the one who put this little bit of stuff up on this slide. So it's interesting, if you ask someone what a standard is, there are very, 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 very different definitions depending on um, which group you're talking to um, and what they want to accomplish. And it ranges all the way from uh, someone saying, well, basically the two of us agree. We wrote this down. We have a standard, okay? Um, all the way to probably you know, one of the most extreme is sort of, if you look at ISO, you know, you have five years of discussion through a whole bunch of uh, working drafts, committee drafts, international uh, draft standards, um, and eventually you have votes from member, you know, member country standards organizations uh, to publish. And so there's, there's really, uh, you know, basically virtually no process to kind of extreme process. And so we didn't really want to start with a, a definition more than just to say that there are disagreements about what it means to be a standard. And so now, as we talk through different activities, different approaches, different factors that uh, you can use to distinguish among different standards, uh, organizations, and processes, you can see what the variety is, and we can discuss, you know, as a group, what are, what are the, the aspects that we would like for the Ethereum community to learn. So basically we set this up with five, five different kinds of pieces. Uh, a couple of us work, or most of us work with two or three hats on in different places, but we're going to present some basic things that we do in different organizations, hopefully quite briefly, just enough to understand what actually happens, and then it's about discussion. It's about what, what do we all want to do as a community, right? How do we want this to work? So today we'll be kind of 
looking at each of these organizations through the lens of a few different factors that help you think about the differences between these organizations. So as Dan was saying earlier, if you think about the definition of standard just simply being for, for our sake here in this classroom today, agreement, how did we reach it? There are a few different ways we can look at reaching that goal, reaching that goal of agreement. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the W3C, EEA, the EIP process, and these, uh, the, the methods they use, the factors they use to, to reach that. But um, the thing we want you to really uh, take with you is that that process, that standards slash agreement making process, is one that we all own as a, as a community of technologists. So um, if you don't like a process, you can participate in changing a process and that should also be part of um, your consideration. So these are some of the factors um, that you'll want to bear in mind and that we'll um, talk about. Um, the first is governance. That's often a bit of a buzzword. I think you probably hear that. A, I, I hear that a lot. Um, this is simply, uh, or, or I should say, to simplify it, uh, we are talking about um, policies that support decision making. Um, it could be a process for how we decide that a decision needs to be made. It can be a process for the decision itself. It could be other policies that support who gets to make that decision, who doesn't, so on and so forth. Can I add one thing to that? Yeah. Which is that governance to me in the end for standards organizations comes down to what happens when there's a disagreement. Who decides, right? Um, that, that's ultimately it, and there may be different levels you know, that you go through, but in every organization, if you want to know in the end how it works, you look at the end of the chain and see who's the final arbiter who makes the decision. Um, is it Tim Berners-Lee in, in uh, the, the web world, is it, um, is it Vitalik? Okay, I think, anyway, so, um, and I'm not arguing that either one of those is actually correct, I'm just saying, you know, it's good to know where the, the final decision lies, and that's largely what we mean when we talk about governance, although it, it ends up getting expressed in a variety of formal, semi-formal, and informal ways. So the next factor we want you to bear in mind is um, IPR, which is an acronym for Intellectual Property Rights. And um, that may be important to you, it may not be, but in the world of formal standard setting, it ends up being extremely important and it's one of the key differentiators between a lot of the standards bodies that you, you are familiar with, like the W3C, EPA, or so on and so forth. And, they're different because they have different approaches to this topic, which is quite complex. So they have a lot of legal support, a lot of staff um, who focus on policy set setting here and understanding how um, different specifications will, um, uh, you know, how the copyright or the patents are, are granted in, on those specifications. I want to add anything on IPR. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Charles. Yeah, I really do, which is we put this out in the public domain and anyone can use it is not a patent policy. It's a fucking disaster waiting to happen. Yeah. Just, just so, yeah, the, the comment I was going to make on that is that um, every standards organization starts with no rules and, there, and no process. And they actually want it that way. If you look at IETF when it started, they were very loose. Um, and gradually, they had to get more restrictive. And you'll notice, if you go to any IETF meeting, that Internet Engineering Task Force meeting, they put up a no well slide at the beginning of every working group, every call, every everything. And they say, if you not, do not understand the contents of this slide, do not speak. Do not give an opinion in any way, shape, or form. Okay? Um, that's not an accident. They got to that point because, they, because there were lawsuits that eventually forced them to go to that. W3C hated the process they saw in the IETF, and when W3C was formed, things were fairly loose and open. And guess what? A company came in and they actually argued for a specification to be developed a certain way, um, and then 
Um, once the specification was done and all the implementations were out, they sued all the implementers because they had a patent on uh, a core piece of technology that they pushed into the spec. Okay? So, you know what? I hate to say it. Every, every org goes through this. They're like, look, we don't want to deal with that stuff until everyone gets sued. And then you're like, oh shoot, we've got to do it too. So we're going to talk about that as we go through. That's a pretty common concern for Organization, so naturally they're quite gun shy. Um, the other thing to note about this is um, these uh, assurances, these policies, assist a specification or a standard um, in being acceptable to certain like levels of business and governments, right? So they are very, very concerned with making sure that the provenance of the IP is secure, and that's what this. That's why this ends up being. A in open source, when you're just sort of rapidly innovating and iterating, like it doesn't really super matter, cool. But once uh, once businesses start to rely on, say, um, you know, government procurement and um, uh, enterprise adoption and that kind of thing, the the provenance becomes even more critical. And this is where that comes from. Actually, um, I, I probably should. Uh, okay, I won't quote him, but we had a conversation. David Visavi of the Linux Foundation, a security maven there, and, and he said that actually his number one problem that he has with donated code for projects at the Linux Foundation is the provenance of the code. They, because when people start projects, they don't track it at all. But when it gets donated, he's the one who has to go and actually check every, essentially every commit going back into history to find out where it came from and what intellectual property restrictions there might be on it. He says it's, it's just an absolute disaster and nightmare for him today. So he's working on, on trying to come up with a better way to fix that. So I know we're spending a lot of time on that. It's because nobody likes to talk about it, but I think it's good for people in this room to understand um, where it comes from, you know, and why we end up having to deal with it. What's the right level of process in the journey? Like you said, for W3C, there's a function of all these things. Knowing what they know now, would they have, on day one, added all those processes in? Yeah. yeah. Would, every yeah. single one of them. So your argument would be for today, in this community, that we should add all these potential processes you, you should have the minimum amount of process possible to not get caught out, let do stuff, because we all like marching in lines. It's about, we want to make sure that the problem does not come up because we stopped it before it started. So it, you should have a fairly lightweight thing. As we go through the different organizations, we'll look at what they do. And it does use W3C pattern process, which I'm familiar with having been through it many, many times, is actually not very painful at all. It's very lightweight. If you're doing the right thing, it's completely trivial. When something bad happens and someone turns up with a patent, there is a mechanism for dealing with it that is about as painless as you can get dealing with patents, which is like when someone's sticking red hot pokers into you, it's like they only hurt a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's go on. Let's get into this. Alright, uh, <coughs> work style, do you want to talk? Self-explanatory. It, it yeah. will be obvious when we discuss yeah. them. IPR, it was worth talking in general, but yeah. not work style. Um, Review process, really, just really quickly. By that, uh, we mean for a number of these organizations, some review period by the public, by a broader membership, by an outside entity, um, is or, or by a group of people concerned about, for example, accessibility or internationalization or security. Um, a lot of times, these organizations will require other kinds of review so that you get more eyes on it. Um, and so that's what we mean by review process. Um, and the last factor that you'll want to consider is uh, which other people or organizations or industry partners, who else is participating in that group? Because that will make a big difference on whether it makes sense to bring your standardization project into that work area. And you'll want to look for places where there's overlap, other people that would be interested working on it, um, or other companies you might want to work with.
Um, so I think we'll just probably go right into our uh, different standards activities um, as it pertains to Ethereum. Um, and I guess I get to start. Okay. So uh, Oasis is fairly new. This, they are new to uh, Ethereum. Not very long ago, the Ethereum research team, uh, along with Consensus and the EDA, approached us about starting this uh, this open project. Uh, and you can check out what the minimum is there. We just started a couple months ago uh, on the Ethereum slash Oasis Open Project GitHub repository. Um, but the purpose was really to try and uh, start filling what we thought might be a, a gap um, to help support standards making uh, where the idea might be that the group wants to um, produce a formal standard, something that would eventually be um, able to go up through to a national standards body or an international standards body like the ISO. Um, and so you can um, check out our, our abstract there on the, on the repository, but we want to uh, basically provide some guidance and some support for folks who want to produce standards in that way. Um, Oasis itself has been doing this for a really long time. They started actually in the 90s as SGML, which is Standardized Generalized, Mark Standard Generalized Markup Language a long time ago, uh, and related XML standards, that kind of thing. Now, um, a lot of their standardization activities focus on security and privacy. Um, it's a pretty large organization. There are thousands of people who have contributed to these standards, and um, there's several hundred standards that they've, they've produced. Uh, this is a consortia, so uh, they, they're typically industry uh, members who come with projects and want to work with uh, other folks in the industry to produce OASIS standards that then move along the national standards track up to, again, the national, international bodies like um, ISO or ITU. Um, not very long ago at all, actually back in March, we uh, announced an open projects program. So if you can think about you know, traditional standards development, there's probably a number of different um, uh, stereotypical sort of thoughts you might have about that. Um, but they aren't really known for doing open source work. Oasis has been supporting open source projects that um, assist its technical committees for some time, and we wanted to open up a program for open source projects that want to benefit from a standards track uh, possibility. So, um, if, which is, is a growing number of open source projects. The program um, helps provide technical governance and fiscal agency. So, you know, if you're part of an open source project, you want to be able to spend money as a group or accept money as a group. Um, we provide the intellectual property rights and community development um, support. So, if you need legal support, if you need um, uh, community management, that kind of thing, and tooling. Uh, it is not a membership organization. It, this, this program is not a, a member org. Um, it, it operates on sponsorship dues, so companies can come in and choose to sponsor a project like Ethereum as Consensus and EDA and the Ethereum Foundation have done. Um, and that cost is on a sliding scale. I mean, I think a lot of times in our communities we're very concerned about where the money comes from and that kind of thing, so I'm just being transparent here. Um, but anybody can participate in the Open Projects program. Um, anybody can participate in the Ethereum Open Project um, There's in, in the technical activities. To do so, however, and again, this gets back to that provenance concern that we, we care about uh, in IPR, they must sign a CLA that includes a patent on a cert, meaning that you're not going to stick anything in there and then go sue everybody. Um, looking at the, those factors, um, this group is, uh, is open, it's free, there's no cost to participate if you're a member of the community and you want to um, contribute.
contribute to the activity of writing a specification because it brings you joy and happiness, then please, you can do that. Um, and if you are a company uh, or an organization that wants to, um, you know, to, to support it in some way and wants to help drive um, longer term direction, for example, <coughs> direction of moving it into a form of uh, an international standard, then you can um, sponsor it and participate on the project governing board. Um, IPR uh, it's, is royalty free and our uh, projects have to use one of several approved open source licenses <coughs> that seem to be the ones that the uh, community members seem to care about uh, Apache 2 and MIT. Um, it works, like the, it, the work style for, for the group is very um, similar to how you work in an open source capacity, a lot of activity on GitHub, uh, mailing lists, teleconference calls as needed, that kind of thing. Uh, from a decision making standpoint, the uh, technical steering groups um, operate on consensus. But uh, again, for the formal piece of it, where we're wanting to move um, a standard through a standard through a, a, a formal standards track uh, that uh, it has to, to be done by a vote of the project board. Um, review wise, the project is able to develop and approve their own specs, um, and you can you know that you can stop there if you want. You don't have to, to move on, uh, but uh, if you choose to. Uh, make a project or make a specification a formal standard with OASIS that means uh, it has to go through the OASIS approval process which provides member and public review uh, periods. Um, yeah, so the work areas that we're looking to get started on um, started with our JSON RPC and token scripts. Um, so if you want to get involved with this, um, I would really encourage you to uh, come you know, file an issue on the repository uh, or come chat with me uh, because these are really bootstrapping right now. We don't have uh, it's like it's a green field space. You can you can come and um, you can get started on your one. We'll give you the slides. You don't have to take photos to try and point down <laughs> the email addresses and stuff. Uh, and then, uh, if there's if there's an area that you um, would be interested in working on, you can also come talk to us about establishing a TSC to focus on that. So. Sort of what is TSC? Uh, a, a technical steering committee. So there's also like a shitload of um, acronyms in standards development. So <laughs> that's also fun. What would be the technical steering committee? that you're helping with establishing such a body of making standards for, for yeah. working on the work. So, so you can analog it could be analogous to like a working group, um, I, I think. Um, yeah, rough, rough, yeah, roughly it's like this is a piece of work we want to do. Yeah. So we have in OASIS term a TSC, a technical steering mm -hmm. committee, to say we are steering the, I don't know, dev P2P development or... Uh, mm -hmm. But that's the group that does the work. Yeah. It's not a planning group. They actually do the work, just like a working group in ITF or WBC or something. Sure. Yeah. 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 Extend the Ethereum architecture. The thing I love about Ethereum is it's based on standards. <coughs> and so we're trying to take things that the enterprise, by which I mean both your know, giant fat cat million dollar companies and organizations like your local you know, government run garbage collection service, or your health service, uh, if you live in a civilized country, uh, any kind of organization who wants to build stuff wants to build on top of Ethereum, uh, but wants yeah, permissioned networks, wants private transactions, and so on. You could do these things by yourself, you can build it by yourself. The point of AEA is, if we have an agreed way of doing it, and we have half a dozen different clients, different bits of software you can use, 
you're not tied to a vendor. If your developer decides to go off to Mars or you know, retire into the mountains, you can get another developer because this is all standard stuff people know. In the same way that if your ETH developer you know, decides to go to the mountains, there are other people who know Solidity, know ETH and can build stuff. Um, EEA, like Oasis, has a, an ISO liaison thing. So at, at our level, we're, we're just a liaison. We participate in TC307, which is ISO's group working on international standards for blockchain. I'm not going to talk very much about ISO, except probably don't want to go there. It, uh, it's a place where people spend a long time working on things like the glossary. What is a blockchain? Is it different from distributed ledger technology? Is it a subset, superset, overlapping set? After 18 months of discussion or something, we as a liaison participate in this discussion, uh, but then it goes to a vote by country representatives. So it's literally, you know, I don't know how many people watch Eurovision, but like Tonga, 12 points. <laughs> And, and that is how the decisions are formally made. Uh, so one of the reasons for the discussion is to try and get to a point where we all agree and it's not going to be a contentious vote. Because in, in bad ISO situations, what happens is some country with a pile of money goes to a bunch of countries with no money at all and says, we will pay you and you and you and you to be members of this group. We'll pay for your representative to go to the meeting so that you vote with us on some crazy stupid idea. Uh, that, that's when ISO goes wrong. That doesn't normally happen, thankfully, but it's a very slow process. It's very, very fun. EEA, not so much. Uh, so the governance, it's a member consortium. You pay to play. Um, we provide a, a staff who consists of about five or six people. Um, a couple of them basically do marketing and talking to members. Uh, my job is make sure the standards process actually works. That's like that. I've spent 20 years doing this stuff, have an idea about how these processes can be. Um, there's an agreement that members sign, and so we can hold them to certain patterns of behavior. Most specifically, of course, IPR. If you are a member, then everything you do goes with a grant of patent license. Anything that you put in, you promise that anybody can license that for free. You can't come back and say, oh, we changed our mind, we decided we want to charge you for our patent. No, too late. You signed it away legally already. Um, our copyright story is frankly a bit dumb at the moment. Uh, if you take our specs, you can read our public editor's draft specs, but if you take and look at the license, it says, all your base have belong to us, you're not allowed to copy this or do anything with it. Why is that dumb? Because if you're on a developer team trying to implement it, what you will probably do is take the spec, chop it into pieces, pass those pieces around to your devs with some commentary. Technically, that's a derivative work. Technically, that is something that you would have to ask us for permission to do? The answer will be yes. You know, unless you're going to publish like EEA version 1A, the answer will be yeah, sure, just use it. And that's the discussion we have within the, the board. There is a board of directors who have formal control. Our work style, like Oasis, and probably like most people, stuff is on GitHub, uh, we make pull requests. Where, where we can, we work by lazy consensus, which is someone puts up an idea, looks like it makes sense, we agree, that's great. But we do have a formal decision-making process, so we have a weekly meeting, a teleconference. The agenda for that meeting is published days in advance, so everyone can see it. And you can always say, I can't go to the meeting, but don't do this. And that is enough to stop a decision from being made the first time. If you just keep saying, don't do this without justifying it, we will put it up for a discussion at the meeting. And eventually, if you've got
got no nothing except we're deciding to do this. We discuss it and agree. Um, so some stuff actually gets discussed at, at teleconferences. Most of the work is on GitHub because people come to agreement and it just works. The the review process is essentially continuous. Um, we publish our specs on a, a six month schedule. It's like at DevCon we will publish a new release. And the theme of this new release is whatever's ready that we finished by the time we get to DevCon. So, so the review is just like an a open source project, literally, whatever got through the, yeah, this is good enough to put in, goes out in the next ship. And, and the one thing is EA is pay to play. It's like to join up, it, it's basically organizations, the starting price is three grand a year. Um, you know, if you're a, a library or a government or a research organization or a small company, the top price is somewhere like 25. Uh, I don't actually know, you should go and talk to the membership people if you want to do that. And right now, our GitHub repo is restricted to members. You can't actually see what's in there. We have heard the feedback that we're not sure what's going on and we don't like being that unsure. We would like more visibility. Uh, so we are going back to take that feedback and say, well, how do we provide more visibility? The concern that people have is, you know, right now, we know who is putting content in. We know who is influencing the direction because they're members, they paid their money. We know who can read the GitHub repo. And they sign the agreement. They sign the agreement. If we open up the GitHub repo, can we still keep that control to make sure that people aren't driving IPR stuff that's bad? That's an open discussion inside EEA. Um, my, my personal feeling is I suspect we can, uh, because I've seen other people do it. But right now, that's the situation. And getting involved, you can, you can follow. This is our client spec. Um, we have the trusted compute off-chain framework. Uh, where you change client spec for trusted computing, I will update this. And we will have some more specs coming out soon. At ntthealliance.org, you can actually find uh, our release documents. But these are our editor's versions. This is just live off GitHub, whatever we've changed that week. Uh, to contribute, you become a member. system is originally based on the BIP, the Bitcoin Proven Protocol system, which itself is based on the PIP system, which is the Python Proven Protocol system, which is based on it. Um, <laughs> um, we've made a few changes because uh, PIPs were originally designed for Python programming language. They are of a slightly different nature to uh, what we're trying to standardize in the Ethereum community. Um, and there's kind of a dichotomy inside EIPs as well, because there are two main types of things people try to standardize. One is uh, more or less contract interfaces and, and other sort of um, application layer standards. Um, and the other is uh, changes that are subject to hard forks and so forth. So there's a lot of overlap in, in how these processes uh, operate. But the end result of one is a standard that basically anybody can volunteer to write their contract to adhere to or their debt to adhere to, or it's a standard for an RPC interface to a node and your, you know, your wallet interfaces with it. Um, and the other is something that requires consensus from all the client developers in order to implement in the next hard fork. Um, so they start off similarly, they have similar discussion processes and so on, but while one basically just requires that it be technically sound and that people up to general agreement of what it should obtain, the other is a much more sort of involved process of, of gathering consensus for a hard fork. Um, so we have those two separate parts and we've made some changes as a result to how uh, EIPs work compared to BIPs or PIPs um, and we've tried to adapt some of the IETF's workflow in this and, and building consensus and building useful standards. Um, oh, no, sorry. 
Uh, so EIP, it is his job, as we see it, is mostly to provide, in fact, almost exclusively to provide editorial services. So we uh, review incoming pull requests, we make sure that the bill doesn't break, we make sure that it, it has the appropriate sections, that it makes you know, basic sense and that somebody reading it can understand what you're trying to write. And we try to set the standard for a new draft very low, again, kind of following the, the uh, IETF's process where anyone can submit a draft. Um, and then we we try and uh, help with the editorial process of getting those standards through, but we're not trying to be the arbiters of what makes a good standard here. We're trying to make that a consensus, a community-driven process. Um, so we try and avoid doing technical decision-making for the most part. Um, the stand, yeah, so the stand process is, is consensus-driven. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so factors, uh, governance, again, it's, it's try, we try to have it driven by consensus. Um, anyone can participate, anyone can write a draft, anyone can offer feedback or technical critique on a draft. Um, and in principle, at least anyone can write an editor, although, uh, that's right, anyone can become an editor, um, although our sort of meta process here for like how <coughs> editors appointed, how is the EIP process itself amended is less well defined at the moment, which is something to do. Yeah, how, how, do you, how do you apply to become an editor? So at the moment, most people. To whom do you apply? Yeah. So so it, this this kind of folds into the like, how do you make changes to EIP one? Because at the moment, what you do is you open a pull request to EIP one that adds you as an editor, and you say, please merge this pull request, and then you wait six months while people argue over who has the right to like add editors and so forth. So that's something we need to, to establish better. The main issue is, as with any other change to EIP one, um, editors are generally comfortable exercising their uh, judgment over changes to individual EIPs or questions about them and so on, but less comfortable about doing that for changes to the entire process, understandably. And because we have, because a lot of our editors are part-time, they're, they're occupied with other things, they may be other responsive, it can be hard to get a consensus among editors to add an editor or, or change the standard. So this is definitely the area in which the process is currently weakest. Um, and actually with consensus, uh, it's rough consensus, right? Like yes. I Yes, okay. it is. So, I'll talk more about that when I get to WQC because they're, what they mean by consensus is different. Yes, and, and you'll probably do a bit of job describing it than I would. So, um, so IPR, uh, this is, please don't hurt me. Uh, <laughs> the, the, all, all the IPs have to be released you know, uh, copyright wise, CC0, but we don't currently have a pattern assignment process. And part of the issue with that, it, it, it's only something that's come onto our radar recently, and it's also. The issue is there's, there's no formal counterparty here. There's no EIPs incorporated. There's no organisation that can sign a contract with you, you know, giving up patent rights. So the, the challenge in my lack of, lack of knowledge here, at least, is, is that without a counterparty, how can you have an agreement that's enforceable? And there's no party here that can, that can sign that and that can take you to court if you try and assert a patent. So I'm hoping the other panelists will have insight into that later. Yeah. Um, I can talk about that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so work style, um, everything's done on GitHub via pull requests and so on. If you write, want to write any draft, you submit a pull request to one of the editors and will assign you a number, which is generally the number of the, the next pull request. Um, it gets merged in as a draft. Uh, after that, we have a bot whose job is basically to allow you to make changes to your own draft or to allow you to accept changes other people want to make to your draft. Um, discussion takes place on a, a basically a forum nominated by the author of the draft. Um, and uh, if you want to progress your draft past the draft phase and into, into a standard, we have a sort of a lightish weight process by which the draft author can nominate for it to go to final call. They have to provide a certain amount of time for people to provide the feedback. Uh, during that time, people can provide technical feedback. And at the end of the last call, the author is expected to provide a summary of all the objections that were raised and how they address them. And then the editors look at that summary and decide whether they think you know, they've been adequately addressed and either kick it back to draft or accept that it's, that it's final. Um, this is the process for, for ERCs, for the, the contract level standards, the application layer standards. Um, for uh, consensus standards, for things that go hard for in principle, it's the same. And then afterwards, the devs decide whether they want to accept that into a fork, and if they do, they, they add it. In practice, it's a little more messy. Um, stuff often gets into forks before it's fully finalized. Um, something may need changes in, as a result of the developers implementing it and finding issues and so forth. 
Um, so that's another area in which it's a bit messy at the moment. Um, uh, so I just talked about the review process, and um, it's, it's run entirely by volunteer editors um, and supported by the EF who provides some of the structure and so forth. Uh, some of the editors are, you know, are EF employees, I'm a former one myself. Um, but if you want to participate, uh, next slide please. Uh, okay. um, please uh, open a PR if you want to write a draft, uh, open a PR if you want to amend the process, and then we can argue about how we see our process amendment process is. Um, and, and likewise, if you want to become an editor, talk to us. We, we can always use more volunteer help. Be aware that it is, uh, you get very little accolade for it and, and a lot of drudge work. Uh, so it's a wonderful thing. Please come join us. <laughs> and, and that's it. Thank you. Role of the editor, you're, you're, you're basically assessing technical correctness. Are there uh, requirements for like documentation? Are there other like what are there? Yeah, so so partly because we believe in, in sort of making the process open and decentralized, and partly because we have a limited number of volunteer editor hours, yeah. we try to make this as much the community jobs, the community's job as possible, yeah. um, and that's what the final call phase is supposed to sort of help resolve. But really the, the goal is that it doesn't get accepted as final unless it is clearly mm -hmm. described, it has the, the necessary sections, they, you know, it's a standard where somebody could read it and then something compatible without having to have long discussions with the author and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, and ultimately it's the editor's job to make sure it doesn't get through unless it meets that, but we try and uh, make that as lightweight as possible by, by getting that in, in the explicit <coughs> feedback from the authors. Is there, is there any check of, like, who cares? So, you know, can I write the IP for some crazy idea I had that I am the only person who will ever bother reading to the end of this because everyone yep. says, that's just stupid. Um, not really, no. I, I've said before that, that you know we try not to, to decide whether your standard is a good idea or only whether it's a well like an, an implementable idea. So if you want to submit a standard for like the best way to blend kittens, then you're horrifying. But that <laughs> probably <laughs> you right. could be right. Yeah. A lot of people who use Ethereum magicians will get feedback on ideas, right? Yes. Uh, so so you know there's no officially required place that you have to like have it. You have to have a discussions URL. It has to be possible for anyone to post there. We don't have a requirement that it must be a particular place, but the theory of tradition is a very popular place to do that because it's a gathering of, of people who have the insight to comment on it. Um, long term, I would really love to see more, like we've got magicians' rings, which are we call it working groups. I would love to see them take up the reins for shepherding uh, uh, standards of a particular type. Uh, again, sort of borrowing a little from the IETF. If you want to write a standard that does X, it would be nice if the editors could say, that's great, please go talk to the, the Magicians Working Group for X. And if you want to do it on your own, you should have you know, good reason why you're using up all of that time to do that instead of going talking to the experts. Um, but that's currently, that's not currently the case. What are some other areas in which you think, what are some other areas in which you need to improve the IP process? Um, I, mean, I, think, I think the most important thing is the meta process, you know, the around. Uh, modifications to the process because if we don't have that locked down then we don't have a clear path to resolving anything, you know, we have to have that first. Um, but I, I basically I would like to see more ways to make it more systematic so that it's, it depends less on how much time and attention the editor had available to spend on it um, and on ways to make it more, uh, more sort of procedural in terms of, of making sure that people understand what makes step is and how they can do it and so forth. Do you think that there's more incentivization for EIP editors that more people would try to get involved? Can you hear back there? Not really. Oh, I'm, sorry. A oh, um, I'm saying if there were more incentivization layers in the EIP process for editors or people kind of adding to the, the, the whole program, do you think it'd be more engaging and more efficient? It, it's it's difficult to say. I think there's there's the psychological effect where if I ask you to pass me a glass of water, you do. And if I offer you five cents to pass me a glass of water, you're insulted and you say no. Um, and and I think so. I think you need to be very careful about you know we'll give you a gold star every time you approve a pull request or something, um, because I don't think that's why most EIP editors volunteer. Um, 
but also we do have this volunteer effect. You know, I think that rather than like direct incentivization, a better thing might be if, if someone like the EF could just say, we have a budget to hire a full-time EIP editor. You know, that is their job now, you know. And if they don't enjoy it, then well, sorry, it's your job. Sometimes you don't enjoy your job, you know. Um, that might be a better way to make sure things moved consistently. Yeah, it's also the case that if you if you provide an incentive to people and you say, we're going to pay you for putting stuff into a spec, it's like, hey, I can get free money for making work for other people. Who, do, who does this benefit? And the answer is, not the people you make work for. Uh, not the ecosystem where that work suddenly becomes a big distraction. Only the person who's actually taking a pile of money to do stuff that's essentially useless at best. Or you and end up with the reverse effect where I'm incentivized to just accept every pull request no matter how bad because I get yeah. paid five bucks per pull request. Right, so, right. Yeah. So, so there's... Well, let's say the working group builds the spec and does the development side of it. Do you think they should be incentivized in that way? Hey, I'm not against incentive schemes except that I don't actually know of one that is set up well enough to work. Basically. So, only last question I have on this, and, and then we should move on so we can <laughs> get to others here. But it's um, when there are disagreements. Could you talk about a time when there are maybe controversial subjects and how those how those end up getting resolved? So, um, to some degree, these have led to reform of the IP process. Um, so, the, the really the, the big ones that come to mind are things like. Um, Rescue VIPs, I think it was 998, uh, you know, which proposed to, to rescue some parity funds and so on. And the, at the time, we were less clear about the role of editors and so on. So it was seen that, like, if an editor approved this as a draft, they were giving the sample of authenticity that this is how we should govern it. You know, this is what we should do in the next hard fork and so on. So when things have been controversial, it's, it's often been because there's a perception that the EIP is exercising control over how the network operates or over what should be accepted. And our response has been to try and separate those concerns to say that we're trying to write standards. We're not trying to tell you that you should implement standards or force people to run standards. Um, and so, so that's been the main source of controversy. There's certainly this case is where people have strong disagreements over the contents of something, so you try and finalise it and they say, oh, you're my dead body because this is a bad standard. And ultimately, I think you, there's no easy solution to that. You just have to build a process where um, generally technical concerns get addressed in a technical manner rather than a personal manner. And if somebody is, is adamant in, in standing their ground, then you have to have people who can review them and say either, yes, this is a valid concern that should block implementation, or no, we believe that's out of scope, or that's irrelevant, or, or it's not part of the standard. Um, and that ends up being like the core devs, essentially, right? Kind of uh, for, for standard writing, it ends up being the editors, but, but you know, should this make it into the standard, in, in the sense of, you know, is it technically sound? In terms of should it be implemented, um, then that does become the core devs. You know, you could, I could write a form of EIP today that says, as of block number X, my account gets 10,000 per ether. Um, and I believe that that should be standardizable. But I also believe that all the devs should immediately summarily reject it, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you just um, get out a presentation and reload it? It should. That's... No. <laughs> um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Um, like for all these bodies, do you do you guys publish all your processes in a way that uh, anyone can actually read them and find their way through? <coughs> Sadly, everyone is at the EA does. Yeah. Um, uh, Basically, to find the EEA's process, we, we have a formal process that we don't use much. Uh, formally, there's a procedure for you know, when things really go bad, we can have a vote on stuff. Uh, that's damned hard to find. Uh, if you have access to the GitHub repos, if you're a member, 
then we have uh, you know, documents about our basic working style, how we have you know, get agendas out, how you can object to stuff. As far as I know, everybody else's stuff is just public. You can read those processes. In the case of the IP, C1 describes how you write an EIP, how it's standardized and so on. Um, as I say, it doesn't describe how it itself should be modified, and there is a bit of received wisdom that just doesn't make it into the EIP, you know, the, the convention of this is how you do little thing X, you know, which is a, is a way to improve the process. Stuff the editors know, but forgot to write down. Yeah. That's, that's actually why I was asking because I was trying. I, I was actually filing a, a change for ERP one some time ago, and it, I found it kind of hard to actually uh, from ERP one get to a, a, an overall process view on what am I expected to deliver and what is, at what stages do I have to wait for others to actually um, provide comments on it, or do I even have to go hop on a core apps call and show it there as well? And even though it's just a change to ERP one, why is it in the core apps call? Because of, it's kind of very confusing. I ended up creating my own process diagram for it, so so, so I can just follow it and go through. Because you, you should put that in a pull request yeah. to ERP one yeah. because that's really useful. I, I actually yes. sent this over to a few people at the EF already, yeah. so I can also edit there. So this, this, I'm just going to add this. So this process started six months ago, maybe, and all of these like, record everyone that said, okay, it should, 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 should be merged and still hasn't been merged. And even whether the change about like, adding security consideration to the other EIPs. Yeah. So that change is a good change, is another big it's like, it's change. I'm looking there. at it just yesterday, in fact. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a very simple yeah. change in here. Yeah, and also that those charts that he's talking about was present at IETF, and it was interesting that IETF in Montreal, they don't want to talk about blockchain. Mm -hmm. so, so I would give you one thing, a very simple change that requires like, you know, what, a thousand EIPs or something. And if you want a thousand EIPs to change, then it, it ain't so simple. I don't, <laughs> I don't think it was it, if, if you go forward, it, 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 right. it, was, it wasn't meant in that, in that way. Sorry, I, I didn't want to bury it in the details, but yeah. If, if we go back, for example, for where uh, ERP comes from, from, uh, from the Bitcoin protocol, Bitcoin, Bitcoin uh, got this stuff from, from PEP. Yeah. PEP has security considerations. Yeah. Bitcoin just got rid of it for some reason. ERP got it. It didn't make it into ERP because it wasn't in Bit. So that's actually just... Yes fixing what we, what we lost on the way. Yeah. No, I, I, I looked at it earlier today, it looks well reasoned, it should probably be added, and it runs into that hole where the modifications for EIP-1 itself aren't well described, and I as an individual editor also don't feel comfortable merging something, at least I know the other editors are okay with it, and they feel the same, and, and we, need, we need to better formalise that. No, no, I'm just the, the crowd okay. to get a consensus. So that's, so that's funny, that's like with, with ETH2 actually, which um, I uh, I think I got a, a section stub in in some of the, like the Viga chain spec for security considerations and privacy considerations, and they've since been removed. So, yeah, this is a, uh, it's a bigger discussion topic, I think. Yeah. Let's, let's mark that up as a thing in the show. Yeah. But, but the most, the most security, security considerations are always addressed, it's just not proactive, it happens at the end of the life cycle of the EIP or whatever it is. That's, that's way but too... Like, yeah, so I mean, it should be at the beginning, right? Yeah. You can drag all this information along, basically, so that I, even like us auditors, we could jump in and help previewing your EIPs or whatever is in there. But like the, the main feedback that I wanted to give for EIP is that it was in many stages unclear for me, like, uh, in what stage is my EAP right now? It, it, it used to be in limbo mode for some months because I was actually waiting for someone else to do something, uh, which was kind of unexpected for me because like, I found a pull request. Uh, I had discussions on the Magicians Forum. There was only like positive feedback for that. It was only like, a formal change in, in, in something that is not really uh, highly debatable whether we want to have it in there. Uh, and I just didn't know like how to push forward at some point. What is the forcing function to, to make it keep going? <laughs> okay, um, so W3C, that's the World Wide Web Consortium. It's the group that defined HTML um, and related specifications. Okay, so you all know what that is. Um, next slide. Um, so 
governance. Um, there are basically two, I mean, there are, there are more than two kinds of groups, but the two main ones that most people care about are community groups and, uh, and working groups. So community groups are completely open, completely free to participate in. Um, they also require no resources or support from W3C, which makes it easy to provide them that way. Um, the uh, working groups are membership based, and I put corporate. It's actually organization, like Charles said. So you know, it could be um, it could be governments or or schools or libraries or whatever. Um, but the point is, it's a, a paid membership. Um, allows uh, members of your companies to work in working groups for anything that is a standards track specification. The uh, IPR is essentially a custom uh, grant. There's a, a royalty-free license uh, required for anything you contribute in a community group. So if you contribute to a, so actually to contribute in a community group, you have to sign an agreement that says that any contributions you make, you will, you will grant royalty-free. Um, once you get to a working group, it's actually a royalty-free license for anything in any of the specs produced by that working group, unless you disclose. So within a working group, you have an opportunity to disclose that you have um, a patent and request an exclusion from the policy. And the reason for that is that, you know, let's say maybe you don't want to give up the rights to that IPR. Well, that's fine. But the group needs to know, so now they can make a decision whether they want to change the spec or not. Okay, so there's no surprise there, at least. And there are certain mandated points at which um, you, know, you, you get an opportunity to do this exclusion or, or disclosure. Uh, working style like the others, mailing list, GitHub, um, a number of groups have regular teleconferences. Um, but this is what I wanted to talk about consensus. W3C has one of the, the strongest consensus requirements of any standards organization I've ever seen. ITF started with, uh, uh, they, they use rough consensus, okay? Um, they like to say rough consensus in running code, and you know, Ethereum groups in general have adopted that. Um, rough consensus does mean though that you might, you know, you or five of you might just be out of luck, right? Um, and in fact, IETF feels, I know I'm talking about WBC, but IETF feels so strongly about that, that, that the way they get, uh, they determine whether there's consensus in a physical meeting is through a hum. And you might think that sounds really strange, okay? So they say, hum if you want this, hum if you want this. And the reason they did that is so that if you and your boss are sitting next to each other, your boss cannot tell what you voted for. Okay, so that, they, they really want people to be able to give an independent opinion, but to be able to get a general sense of the room, okay? And they, and they do that, right? So they'll go, oh yeah, it's pretty clear, there's like three people back there trying to hum really loudly, okay? But the rest of the room just doesn't want to do that. Now, Deb, yes? I, I think it's worth highlighting though, this isn't a majority wooden stops, you know? It's not, no, it's not. Like 95% said yes, so it's through, you know? it, it's, No, it is not a vote. Now, and in W, okay, so, right, like ISO, it's a vote. Um, in the EA, as you said, you're trying very hard not to go there. We, we have a voting procedure. I'm very happy that in all my time at EEA, we have never had a vote. Right. Uh, it's always been, you get to consensus. So W3C goes with an, uh, uh, just an extremely strong notion of consensus, and it's way beyond rough consensus. Yeah, um, basically, I, I'm trying to remember like, when it was started, I think, you know, sort of they looked at IETF. Yeah, they, 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 they were Tim copied IETF. Yeah, but then they said, mm -hmm. no, if there are people disagreeing, you need to talk more. Yeah. And so that's where that came from, and it's just, so it can take longer to get some things out, um, and it doesn't mean that things don't go forward without a few people disagreeing, but boy, you really, really have to work to make sure that you accommodate disagreements. Um, no voting. Yeah. So then, that sounds like my understanding of the ITF, though. In the, like, if you, rough consensus doesn't mean you just ride roughshod over the three people who object. It means that if you want to go past those objections, you have to have assessed them and then just to either take them into account or see if that's out of scope. Not necessarily. I've been in lots of ITF meetings, and um, usually they will ask those people what their opinions are, but in many cases, by the time you get to that point, you already know what their opinions are. 
Um, it's just that they disagree with the rest. And if they're really, there's just like a couple of like, no, I, I, don't, I don't agree with this. And, and it's been discussed on the mailing list extensively, then they go ahead. In, in principle, they're pretty similar. In practice, W3C enforces you know, a much deeper level of yeah. you really have to explain why you overrode this thing. Um, now, if there are two different camps, um, clearly IETF will will deadlock until it gets work until it gets resolved. Okay, but but as far as rough consensus, they will they will go over the uh, the, the small. They just feel rough. Yep. <laughs> That's what rough consensus means. Yeah. Um, so uh, review process. Um, yeah, uh, working drafts which don't imply consensus. Um, and then a review process uh, and implementation, and of course you try to get implementation as early as you can. But the reason I want to talk about the review process in W3C, there are basically three things that W3C is really known for. One is royalty-free specs. Okay, so the, um, the specs themselves are, are free and open to read. It's not like ISO where you have to pay to get them. Um, and then to implement them, all, everyone who worked on it at least will give a royalty-free license to it to implement it. Um, the strong consensus is another one. And then the third one is their review process is, it, they have a pretty formal review process where it's this, um, you know, your group works, then they require that other groups at W3C look at it, and, it, and actually outside of your community, you're required to demonstrate that anyone else who might peripherally be connected has reviewed it. And then they specifically have accessibility, internationalization, security, and privacy groups in W3C who, who must sign off. Now, IETF does the same thing, actually. IETF, the IESG does that. Um, effectively, the other groups in IETF have to agree formally. Uh, and this is one of the things that um, I think could be looked at, whether it's for, I don't know whether ETH1 you know, ETH stuff needs it, but for ETH2, I. I think eventually they're going to need something more like this, where there's a, a clearer, you know, defined time when security people get in there, people who are who have agreed to be, yeah, we're going to be security reviewers, do it, and so on. Um, okay, next slide. Um, yeah, so W3C has a lot of different activities, and I just listed, uh, you know, between 10 and 24 of these community groups, many of them are not even active. Uh, they all got started rapidly a few years ago when, you know, things were hot. Um, but they can all be, you know, kicked up anytime anyone wants to. Um, there are a couple of, um, there's a standards track working group that I mentioned that I do want to talk about, decentralized identifiers. Um, I'm not going to say anything really about what it is. Um, uh, more than just to say, if you don't like email addresses, uh, Facebook accounts, and URIs as identifiers, um, then come talk to me. Next. Uh, okay, so um, work is done in public mailing lists and the GitHub repos. And this is both for uh, community groups and, um, and working groups. Now, um, so you can follow it very easily. Okay, um, to contribute. So, as I mentioned, uh, there is an IPR uh, commitment at, at some level. So, uh, if it's a community group, it's a personal commitment. If it's a working group, it's your company's commitment for all specs that come out of that group. Now, um, to submit pull requests in, in working groups uh, requires membership, uh, typically. And, and again, that's because of really uh, serious concerns about, about IPR. Um, now, there, there are other venues if, if that becomes a problem, but, uh, but in general, it is direct contributions that require, uh, that require membership. Uh, for leading? So, well, so W3C also has a, a concept of an invited expert. I didn't want to go there. But yeah. So, so <laughs> there, there are cases where if you're an outstanding individual and you, know, yep. you work for a two-bit company that it doesn't have the money to join or, or you work for a large company that has nothing to do with the web and won't join, there is a mechanism for saying we want this person in the group so bad, we will give them the right to do it. But it's very much held as a privilege for our excellent. Right. Um, if you want to lead, um, yeah, you, it's just like everyone else said, you just do more, you volunteer, you say I want to do this. Um, now, if you're going to do that in a working group, you are going to need to be 
a member or invited expert? I think member or Edison Phillips. <laughs> okay, next slide. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about ETH2 also. I drew a short straw here. Um, so please don't shoot the messenger. I'm sure I got something wrong um, because I don't know that anyone even agrees officially what the process is. I talked with a couple of people and they're like, yeah, that's kind of what it is. Kind of, sort of, maybe. So these are some statements along those lines. Um, governance is very <coughs> informal for ETH2, okay? Um, it's basically <coughs> guided by, guided, guided, okay, guided for the coding, by the Ethereum Foundation and, uh, and developers, okay? Um, and of course, influenced by, you know, individuals who have been um, instrumental in past versions of Ethereum. Um, interestingly, you know, if you look at who has final say, uh, actually I didn't talk about this with W3C in the end, right? They don't vote. If there's a disagreement and you get all the way sort of to the end, the director will decide. Where the director is Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee right now has, is on sabbatical. He's been on sabbatical for a long time. There's an experienced person representing him who acts as the director now. That may change over time. Okay. So anyway, ETH2. Um, it's actually the, uh, the editors that have final say um, right now for ETH2. And that's only because they're the ones who put it in. Now, I'm not saying they're arbitrary. I'm not saying they're inappropriate. But today, they are the ones who make that decision. There's no other group that says to the ed that, you know, that can say to the editors, you must undo this. Sorry, could you expand on who the editors are? I'm assuming you're not talking about the ETH editors. Uh, not ETH2 documents. So there's Beacon Chain uh, and so on, right? So um, Danny, Ryan, Aya. So you mean the, the editors uh, not Aya. I'm sorry, yeah. uh, Shaolin. Whatever, I'm sorry. The editors of the ETH2 specs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant. Yes. Thank you. That's a very good, relevant question here. Um, I, right, so, and, and I say EF editors. Um, I, I probably shouldn't say EF editors. Danny Ryan is kind of like the, one of the primary ones. He's not the only one. Um, but the, the EF has, has taken on itself the role of coordinating and making sure that progress continues to happen. So that's why they're in that uh, position. Um, IPR, so all of their documentation, everything, including specs, is licenses uh, CC0 and 1.0 Universal. There is no uh, IPR. No patent. No patent policy. Um, working style, yep, GitHub. There are bi-weekly teleconferences, but um, that's for discussion, but again, all the work really happens in GitHub. Um, for the review process, I, it's informal. It, you know, the community just reviews and talks. I, I am not aware of any any kind of formal review process. There, uh, there is not any formal stage at which it will get a security review or privacy review or whatever. Although there are times when um, that tends to be requested more than other times. Um, and you know, from my perspective, this is this is an area where eventually they really should look at actually maybe um, at least saying, hey, now is when we want to seek that. Um, and the advantage of, of having that not just get lumped in with all review is that it lets the people developing it up, at, up front get to have some time working on it before, you know, to like coalesce uh, their, their thoughts. Um, before it gets the, the detailed security review. Um, okay, um, so the other thing is that, um, just like ETH1, the work is very community focused. Um, so there's this kind of um, belief, you didn't, you didn't talk about this particularly, but it's more about implementation than the development of the, of the specs. Um, there's, there's always this kind of uh, implicit, well, you can always fork it. You can always fork it. You can always fork it. You don't like it? Just fork it. No big deal. Okay? Um, the truth is that a very large scale defection would be considered failure. Okay? So no one wants any kind of big fork. If, if, so this is where the rough consensus thing happens, right? So you get a few people who disagree and they really disagree strongly. They're just going to go and they're going to make their own copy and they're going to try to convince the world that everyone should walk away from those losers, you know over in the room over there and, and, and follow them. But 
if, if there's too big a group, then that's considered a bad thing. What did I miss? Because for me to talk about E2 is kind of like embarrassing for me, for me to say anything about it. I mean, the reason you got the job is I got no idea either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I paid attention. Um, okay, yeah. It's been off and on for a while. <laughs> okay, uh, next. Oh, yeah. Um, all of you know this. You're a DEF CON. Okay, phase zero, phase one, phase two. Uh, phase zero implementation is actually happening and there's been a, uh, an interop event which is really, really, really cool and it helped them a lot as it does every group that does it when you get stable enough. Um, apparently the phase one spec work is, is stabilizing and phase two, like, I mean, even coming up with a list of what <coughs> phase two is, it doesn't work. And, and, and if you want to know more, there's great sessions on this yesterday and the day before. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Everything you ever want to know happened. Back in already. time, attend the session. Okay. That's it. Oh, oh, there's getting involved. Oh, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, there are any number of places you could go. Um, I, look, I, I am a little biased. I get some information from Ben Edgington and Consensus cause, and Pegasus because we both work there. But he actually has a really good blog that he maintains. Um, the up updates regularly about the status of ETH2. And it really is a good place to, if you just want to follow without having to go read all the, all, all the GitHub uh, issues, then that's a really good way to do it. Anyone can submit issues if you want to participate um, and, and pull requests. Um, I believe they still require commit signing for this. So for most developers, that's not an issue. But one of the things that I have learned um, from many standards efforts is that um, there are often people who want to contribute who are not necessarily technical people. They actually care about, um, you know, societal impacts and things like that. And they may not know how to use GitHub at all, much less figure out how to, how to get a signature on their commit. So that is something to, uh, to think about. And, you know, as far as leading, boy, you, you need to be ready to live and breathe it because um, it's, it's all it's all in issues and calls and, and people's heads and, uh, you know, uh, and random documents spread all over the internet, so it's just not easy. Um, it's like a race, right? Leading is easy. You just got to run faster than everyone else. Yeah, pretty much. So I asked Ben, you know, what to do, and he gave me a list like this. I said, okay, great. <laughs> so I made three bullet points. Um, some places you can follow, you can contact Danny Ryan, uh, a couple ways there. Um, and there is a live stream of the of the bi-weekly calls. Um, or you can just ask Danny again. <laughs> so I should just add to that. Uh, ETH Hub has a really great overview of ETH2. It talks about all the clients that are working on implementations and how they have interop of, at the offsite. And it, it's a great place to learn everything about ETH2 and get started. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, that's it. All right. Thank you. Sweet. <laughs> so Unlike all the current standards that are, they've all talked about, um, we have the privilege at Maker to start from scratch and learn from all the, the mistakes that have happened in the past and take all the great things that have worked for you guys. Um, so right now we're doing a lot of research into how to open up the way to improve Maker to the entire, uh, anyone who has access to the internet, I suppose. Um, and similar to the EIP process, it inherits from EIP, BIP, and PEP process. Um, create a standard approach to proposing new improvements, standard specs, and just overall changes to the protocol. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that we need to consider when implementing a standard for the Maker protocol and overall ecosystem. Um, some things that, actually, as a breakout session, I want to open it up to people's opinions. So if anyone has anything that they think could work, I'd be happy to hear it. So standardizing the improvement proposals, there's templates that allow people to kind of propose it easily. They have to follow the criteria, they put it up there, and it gets reviewed by an editor. If it makes all the, if it checks all the criteria, it can move throughout the process of the life cycle and get it on its way to being implemented. Governance overall, I mean, from our perspective, we had to kickstart the program from the Maker Foundation, um, and it would be governed by the community and the MKR holders. So. We've been really considering what is the best way to get consensus. Should we continue to use our NPR votes? Should we have kind of
kind of casual polls on discourse forums or um, forums in general, um, or should we just hear the loud voices on community calls? In terms of the workflow, everything would be kind of focused around GitHub. We would have the entire process on there where people would submit their PRs, be using the templates that we provide. Uh, discussions would happen on discourse where uh, the ideas would either get rejected at conception because it's been repeated or the idea just isn't accepted or viable. Rocket chat to reach out to everyone involved, and then we would have the voting community calls potentially to um, make consensus and decide on these things. The, re the review process would be a little more formal than the EIP where the editors do review the specific criteria and make sure all the check marks are, are, are made in order to move it through the next stages. And the community would be heavily involved as well. Like I mentioned, the idea of having polls and votes is, is interesting and we might want to consider that. The key stakeholders that I find would probably be likely involved are the editors, um, the people who check all the criteria to make sure this thing can go through. The authors are typically technical leads who have an idea to improve the protocol in itself. Uh, the coordinators are the kind of managers who make everything happen. They coordinate with the, the editors, the authors, and other stakeholders involved, such as implementers. And they would also speak with auditors to make sure that the technical implementation is uh, feasible and technically sound and no potential failure modes. So the types of changes are really interesting. So the processes would be very different. For a protocol change with the smart contract layer, um, you would have to go through a very much deeper process. A process could be a change to the program in general. Like we mentioned earlier, the EIP process for changing EIP1 isn't really defined, so it, it, it's less likely to get pushed through. But if you define that at the beginning, it's a lot easier to actually improve the program iteratively. And there's just general requests for comments on um, concerns with security or failure modes and all these different things. In terms of our activities, we're very much in a research phase and trying to finalize the, the program in itself. Um, once it's finalized, it'll all be accessible through GitHub and a dedicated website similar to uh, the EIP website that tracks the history of all EIPs merged and the categories they fall into. The phases of the launch would likely be we release the program, all the documentation is there for read. Everyone can go through it and understand how it works, the life cycle of them, um, the people involved, stakeholders, and just overall the upgrade types. The editors would be more form formally defined, likely. Um, as I mentioned, the Maker Foundation would be kickstarting this program, so we'd probably have someone internally to manage the editor process at first, but it would evolve over time where community members would be vetted in, uh, respected community members, uh, based on their contributions in the past, and they would proceed that way. And then just forums to have a one location to discuss everything as opposed to over social media, Twitter, everything happens on Twitter, but you can't really archive that and go back to those conversations where people rip on these security issues and forget where it is. So having it all in one place is very important. Um, that's the purpose of ETH Magicians, to kind of have like, one place to discuss all these things, and I think that's really important for us. And then we have our first use case where we kind of implement it in dog food around process and um, make it simple for the rest of the people in the community to do that as well. So if you want to have a conversation with us about this, you can reach out to us on our Reddit. MakerChat probably is the best source to do that, and um, the Telegram as well. So I'm going to pass it off to Jory to oh, yeah. do this. Um, well, I guess all of this. So um, one of the challenges that we run into in this work is competing specifications developed at competing organizations. organizations. Um, and you know, famously, this you know can be viewed uh, with the HTML specification, where you had what WG and the W3C developing essentially two different versions of um, that technology uh, for a long time, and it's only recently starting to that situation is only recently starting to really resolve in terms of those organizations working together and stuff again. So, um, one, I think, I think we intended mostly to talk about uh, the conflict between these two, between different organizations here. 
um, and I think every work kind of handles it a little differently. Um, perhaps more pertinent to this group would be um, if there are conflicts between, say, EEA specifications and EIPs. And so I wonder if you could start there. So, part of our approach at the EEA, because, because you know, we have to be on the inside to see what we're doing, uh, is we take responsibility for figuring out if there's a, you know, a conflict. And, and as a general principle, the idea is you build on top of what a theory makes. So, to a first approximation, if, if these things come in conflict, it's our job to fix it. And, and basically to make sure that we are no, we are no longer creating conflict. Um, and, and any place where we do think we're going to seriously impact public Ethereum, public Ethereum stuff, our policy is we will go and write the EIPs, we will do that work in the standard EIP process. So far that hasn't actually come up. We, we, we just haven't had a case largely we're, we're not mature enough and our stuff is not good enough to be like, yeah, we're going to go and change the, the public, the way Ethereum works. Um, we, we may in the next six months or a year, uh, you know, there's, there are signs that we will consider because we've talked about, oh, if we do this thing, then part of doing this thing is we need to go and write an EIP and tell the universe how we're doing it. We set up a, a registry for pre-compiles. It's like, if we create a, a, an EA pre-compile, we should be really clear to the rest of the universe what that pre-compile is and where it is and how you find it and know about it. And so far that registry is a web page that says, this is a registry where we will put these things if we ever make them. Uh, it's empty. But again, those things might happen, but we, Essentially, I think the, the conflict thing is our approach is we should make sure we're not in the way. It's our job not to be in conflict. And formal standards, too, which oh, yeah. by that I mean like standards developed by national bodies or by the W3C, by EEA, by these consortia groups, they often will form these liaison partnerships as well with organizations that they learn are doing similar or related work and my understanding is that recently the Ethereum Foundation and the EEA also developed a, a liaison shift there to start this process. We, so, so we set up a group which is the main networking group um, and very unfortunately they're sort of meet up at DevCon to figure out what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. Was it exactly the same time as this session? I have no idea what they did, although I'm responsible for making it happen. Um, that, that's going to be fun. Chemek, were you there? Chemek, tell us what they did. Yeah, what they did. What they say? Oh, no, 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 no. There was a session two days ago where we were talking about collaboration. Yeah, there was, there was an introductory session. Um, but yeah, the basic idea is just to have a, a group that's actually you know, EF chairs the working group. Uh, EF is a member of EEA, so EF staff can all go and get inside the GitHub and see what's happening. Uh, and, and that, you know, I mean, they don't even pay. They got a free membership. Uh, but basically, they're there to keep us honest, make sure that, that we're actually doing what I said we would do. The other, because um, you reminded me of this actually earlier, we did talk about how the organizations deal with conflict directly like within a, in a group. We talked about technical disagreement, but um, you mentioned that oftentimes when we do disagree, the, there can be personal, more personal um, matters brought to the fore which are not relevant. Um, so I'm curious if we, if, if there's a codes of conduct or professional conduct or and um, things like that. Is that something that this that y'all care about generally? I guess would be a question. WCC has one. There's a uh, there's a code of conduct actually, and um, they have a positive work environment group that forms specifically to come up with 
um, uh, code of code of conduct. So, um, yeah, it's it's important. It's amazing that you have to teach people what they should have learned in kindergarten. I don't know if you, any of you remember that book. I mean, it's like, I'm sorry, you, you did have to learn how to get along with people, and you know, in kindergarten, and people forget it when they learn how to program. I guess. Um, Bad but, uh, there's no more room, so. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So, <coughs> we don't really have a, a formal code of conduct at the EA beyond the membership agreement, which has some stuff about how you will be reasonable otherwise <coughs> being asked to. Um, but it is really important, and, and a bunch of what I actually do is you know, whenever there are sort of things threatening to, to rise up a bit, Go around and, and actually talk to people and say, look, you know, if you get in a situation where you and those other guys you disagree with and think are stupid, who also disagree with you and they think you're stupid, stop talking to each other nicely, then this discussion is just going to explode and nothing will happen and we will make no progress. Uh, if one of you walks out of the room, we will lose some fairly important perspectives. So. At a technical level, we do want to get to some kind of agreement, and it might be that you know, sometimes you compromise. Quite often, a better technical solution is to say, no, we're not going to have sort of you know, half one consensus algorithm and half the other consensus algorithm on our blockchain. We, one side will agree to lose <laughs> completely, and we will have one consensus algorithm, because that's just easier to implement for everybody. Um, but, but you still want those perspectives and you still want the input. And so you know, making sure that people are doing stuff in a, in a reasonable and friendly way matters. If, if they don't, you end up with only the most painful people you've ever met being the ones who decide things. And, and that doesn't work out well as a rule. Are there codes of conduct in... Yeah, in the past, I've worked on projects that have code of conduct, so it pretty much just sums up what you said. You be nice to people if you're like any of the following like, racist, like any comments, like all these different things. You should be warned and you should be kicked out of the community. You ought to be decent to people. That's pretty much follow suit in any code of conduct for any open source software. So, so one of the tricky things is in a sort of self organizing. Set up. Who is going to take the responsibility for calling out bad behaviour? And and what happens is you call out bad. If someone calls out bad behaviour, and the person who behaved badly may turn around and say, "Well, who the fuck are you to tell me that I'm doing it wrong? You're just being an asshole." And you know, there, there are different ways of establishing some kind of authority. You know, at W3C or at EA, we can basically say. We establish some kind of authority because we have written rules. Uh, in a in a community, essentially, the community's got to decide that they will do this and, and decide that they will back up you know, one side or the other. And and what they decide matters because it influences how this community is going to function in the future. The tricky bit. And technical direction sometimes if yeah the personalities involved actually end up. Not arguing for their position. And it, it can make a difference. I'll just share really quickly that with the Oasis Open Projects, every project is required to have a code of conduct. That's that's a non-starter. You have to have a code of conduct. The project can define what those behavior expectations are. If they want to use an existing code of conduct and process like the contributor covenant, they're welcome to do that. If they want to use something different, that's also that's also fine. But we do require that. But the, the other side of it is you want to be careful in how much you ask the community to do because like, attention is a limited resource. And if you expect your community to spend all of their time you know, working on making your thing work, then they're not going to have any time left to make their own thing work. And, and actually making their own thing work is probably why they're really there. 
So, so there is this really hard balance of how do you make things easy for people to to do the right thing, to participate, and to help. You know, how do you do governance when people would rather someone else did it for them? So we were talking about disagreements um, and the governance really helps solve the technical disagreement piece. So you know, we're going to um, resolve differing opinions on parameter one and parameter two, for example. Um, and then the other kinds of disagreements that uh, we see mediated by organizations um, that, that produce standards are also Maybe political. This can certainly come into the play if you're looking at a consortia or group that has um, interested parties from different countries. Um, that is always a, that, that can really be a consideration, and um, where you may have like implementers in China who have different countries in the US. Um, and then um, obviously disagreements over how a standard should be implemented in a given marketplace. So um, those are maybe less interesting to us right now, but I want to bring it up. So um, I think what we would love to hear is how people um, in this room feel that standardization processes for Ethereum could be you know, um, improved how we can help remove obstacles to you for participating. Obviously, we've identified a couple of things, um, and there's the, the, the big obstacle with PIP1 that we've been talking about. Um, what are things that concern you? What excites you? Um, what would make it you know, easier for you to do your job, frankly, um, uh, in, in standards slash specification making? Or, and also generally what other questions might you have about how the organizations we've talked about today, the processes we've talked about today, work. How would it be easier for you to like improve EIP1? Like, for example, like, what do you want? <clears throat> As I said before, like, the most important part is actually that, it's, it's that there's a process out there that, like, that is published somewhere. It's easily accessible for me and easily understandable for me. Because also, I myself, I don't really have uh, a lot of time to read through all these process descriptions. So if you give me a process chart that I could just follow and I just read up, like, I'm in that stage, so this is what I'm supposed to do, this is what I'm, this is the input, this is, what I, this is my activity and this is the output, and I should wait for someone else at this stage, then it's totally clear and uh, what I have to do with that is um, step is not in, or the EIP in that case is not in any limbo mode and nobody knows what to do with it. So that, this happened, um, I think, two times for me. And that's why it took from, I think, February when I started writing it until now and it's still not uh, really through the whole process um, to actually um, get it that far because I lost track of it at least two, three times because I was actually under the assumption that someone else is now um, giving some feedback on it. And I wasn't even sure who is going to give feedback. So that's kind of, just give me one big picture of how it's supposed to be. So well, just to be clear, the one you were talking about now, is that an EIP or is it an amendment to EIP-1? Um, uh, I initially filed it as a meta EIP. Um, then I presented it at, at, at the CODAPS meeting and uh, it was decided that it should just be an amendment to EIP-1 yeah. and then kind of turned around again and it's kind of was just more confusing in the end. Is this the security considerations? Yeah. Thing? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it definitely should be an amendment to EIP-1. My people have proposed to make changes via memory openings before <coughs> and personally my objection has always been that the process could be hard enough to understand now, but it would be so much worse if you had to read EIP-1 and you had to read all the other EIPs that amend EIP-1 and try and figure out what the, the gestaltable that was. Um, unfortunately, you've, you've picked an area to help us even if it's like the worst. Which is, you know, which is a step in the end, because then we can improve in that part, right? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess, ironically, if you, if you wanted to improve how we handle changes to EOP1, the process would be to write, write, write the proposal to change EOP1. Right? Yeah, I mean, I guess follow your own proposal. <laughs> Yeah, the, the proposal would be to create an EFP that is actually changing EFP1, right? Um, I still think that the way, the best way to do it is, is PR, you know, a PR to EIP1 rather than a PR that amends, oh sorry, an EIP that amends EIP1 <coughs> by, by description, um, just because it would be very hard to, to keep track of the current status of the Having spent like years as the editor of W3C's process, which, you know, W3 started out without a process document. It's just like, yeah, you know, let's be cool and do things nice and be sensible. Uh, and there's been a lot of evolution since then. Yeah. so easy now. Yeah. I'm going to all the way say, have one document which is, here is what you need to do, yeah. and fix so, that document when you need to. Yeah. Uh, but, but one of the things is, you know, if you tweak it every week, no one knows what the heck is in it anymore. But that's right. It still needs to be short enough to have a look at it, understand what it says, and more or less remember it. And and one of the things is if you make changes, it's like seventh text, it's really If you change things every six months, you should have a list of here's what we changed over the last six months or year or however often you expect people to have read the document. So we need a, a PR to EIP1 that says, that modifies EIP1 saying, here is how you make PRs to EIP1. Yeah. And, and then we can have a more clear process. And the big question in that is, who can accept it and what, what is the threshold? I, I actually, I wanted to be good citizen, so I, I read EIP1. Um, I understood in a way that when I want to change any process in, in EIP, I have to get a meter EIP that's actually changing process. So that's kind of like, um, this is how what we are doing, including the change to ERP one then in the end, but with a description of why and all the discussions, so that you can even track the changes, which makes sense because just only editing it, you might lose uh, why you even introduced that change, but you keep and you stick to your actual process. That, yeah, so that's why I started with this one, and at some point, uh, yeah, we all kind of decided that it only that it only requires a PR to ERP one. I put everything in the, in, in the pull request in here. And then we had uh, lots of discussions, a few changes. There's still uh, one, two changes uh, pending right now to make it more clear what to do. But yeah, it, it was kind of a, a hard lesson to learn to follow, follow the process. But it was mainly because it wasn't very clear to me what the actual process is. So setting, setting expectations and being clear about like, who is holding this thing now and who's the next person who's got to do something is, yeah, I think pretty important in most like, processes. Would it help for you? Like, I created a process chart for myself just to be able to next time just follow that one. Um, I can either post it to the Magicians Forum or pin it to the ERPs Forum somehow. And we can together work on that one. It's a draw.io thing, so we can all collaboratively change whatever we have in there. So, so again, just to clarify, is this the process for writing EIPs, or is this the process for changing the EIP one? This is for writing EIPs, like okay. the whole process, yep. all stages in there. So I'm still under the assumption that whenever I want to uh, amend an EIP, I should actually write a meter EIP that is... So if, if the EIP one says that, then in my opinion it's, it's incorrect. The, if you want to change a draft EIP, you send a PR and the, one of the authors of the draft can accept it. Uh, if you want to change a final EIP, uh, then bad luck. Um, <laughs> you should write a new EIP that claims to obsolete the old one and describes how it's done, or ideally describes the whole thing and then sends out. So, so, that, so EIP1 is not final? Sorry? EIP1 is not final then? No, EIP1 is the special status active because it can be amended. Uh, how do you... How do you if you have an EIP and then you have another EIP that obsolete. That's what's going to be my question. Do you, do you actually, you know, when I go to the first one and I figure out that there are five things that claim to obsolete this? So I don't think we, I don't think we do this presently, but the, the generated side could quite easily generate a backlinks for everything that says it obsolete's this. Mm. So far we've been fairly 
I, as an editor, at least have pushed back when some when, when Joe has claimed to write an EIP and not obsolete Bob's EIP. Yeah. At least Bob says, yes, that's okay, you know, because I don't want to get into a situation where somebody's like, my stuff is way better than yours, therefore mm -hmm. yours is obsolete, you know. Um, I think there's room for argument there on whether anyone should be able to just say this obsolete and that's just an advisory thing, or whether it should require the consensus of the original authors. Yeah. That's because there is no official arbiter in the end. I mean, even yeah. in IETF, there's a point when you're done, and and so you can write as many drafts as you want to try to obsolete something else, but it's only when it's gone all the way through the process and it's final that then it actually does obsolete that other yeah. because the entire IETF has agreed mm -hmm. that it does. So if we follow the IETF process, then the obsolete thing becomes authoritative at the point that it's a final standard. The alternative is that we just say that this is this is part of the spec. The spec says it's obsolete, it obsoletes that. So if you want to follow the spec, you shouldn't follow that spec. I think the IETF's process is probably the better one in this case. Yeah, the, the problem you get into, and at some point I think we need to look at like spec A is there, spec B is there, spec B is newer and shinier. What is the the ecosystem actually doing? What are people implementing? Because if you if you have like five specs that you say, well, they're all as good as each other, and we don't want to judge anything. I walk in with my new company and you know, fifty thousand developers to do some work. You know, right? What am I going to work on? Yeah, pick one at random. Yeah. And it, it becomes an unhelpful situation. And actually, slows us down because people are like, no, I'm going to spend my money on. Websites, that's clear. And, and this is where I'd really like to see the, the Ethereum magicians ring slash working group yeah. step up because if you had a working group that says you know they are the working group for wallet standards or whatever, then the editors could say generally we won't accept wallet standard EIP drafts except from that working group, mm -hmm. you know, unless you have a really good reason why that working group can't handle it. And then that working group can take on the job of trying to coalesce standards and so on. Um, because I think it's attractable to expect editors to, to understand the entire ecosystem and know when something's duplicate or it's irrelevant you know, globally. Um, do you have in, in your in your processes somewhere like do you have a process on how to give feedback to the process? EEA doesn't, W3C does. W3C's process includes on how we update this process. But you see as a process working group. Yeah. yeah. That, that it's a community group, it, actually. It, uh, okay, you're right. Yeah. It's a community group. And, and that's what they do, is they discuss changes to the process. And it does get updated, actually, annually now, which is pretty amazing. Isn't it a type of, uh, not upgrade, a type of EIP process? Or, or informational? There is a, informational is a type of EIP. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Wouldn't it be a suggestion to improve a process? I mean, I think um, ultimately an informational EIP doesn't have any power to change a thing. So if you wanted to change it, I think you'd be better just discussing it rather than, than saying it's an EIP uh, and then attempting to get consensus on a change to EIP 1 or whatever the appropriate thing is. I think it would also be pretty interesting to add an archive on EIP Kind of status because there's so many EIPs that are outstanding or haven't been touched in months or years. That, that's been an active discussion recently. Like we, I, my argument was for a more IETF thing where we don't actually number EIPs until they get to a more final state, and that way you can assume that if it's been numbered, it's kind of been adopted and will likely eventually make it to a standard, um, and that your draft is just your draft. You know, it's not the EIP draft. Um, but I, that was met with significant objections. Um, so instead, I think we probably need something like that, where if a draft sits idle for long enough, then you know a, a bot creates a PR warning the author it's going to be merged in a week. The marking it as is, um, stale, you know, as, as not being actively worked on, and then a week later it merges it, and you can reopen it if you want, but it helps clear the clutter. For the TC thirty nine, we have a separate repository and the requirement is that anything that's a draft that is a feature that's just being proposed and worked on has to live in that, in 
in that repository with the namespace proposal dash whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's only when it's finalized that it gets to move into the repository with the actual. I, I would prefer that process. Yeah. Uh, I think in the GitHub working system, it, make, it would make sense just to, it's in your fork of the, the EMS repository, you know, and you just link to there until it's ready to be merged. And merging means it's final. Um, but unfortunately, that was, uh, I was overruled on that. Maybe it's time to reopen the discussion. I think that's, I mean, that's kind of how a lot of other groups are doing yeah. it. I would encourage you yeah. to reopen the wheel. <laughs> uh, I know, that's, that's my point exactly. Um, and no one wants to say what's canonical, that's the, that's the yes. challenge. Yeah, that's the problem. But we have to do it when it gets to final eventually, so why not yes. make that decision or that split earlier? Um, and it, it, it leads to problems because people like file an issue in the EAPS repository with like a five sentence description of their idea and then they say, please see EAP1234 and it's like, it's not neat, but it's just you, you opened an issue and wrote some sentences, you know. <laughs> it, it doesn't even have the required headings, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Anything anyone else wanted to ask about or bring up? I, you're all here for the next session, I'm sure. Yeah. No. Uh, I have one quick question. Uh, incentivization for author, um, for editors, um, or just you guys briefly mentioned it before. Just wondering if you had any more thoughts on that and how to get more involved in engagement for those yeah. who do that. Uh, slip me a twenty, and I'll merge your report. Slip me, slip me a twenty, and I'll tell you the rest of my thoughts on it. <laughs> 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 Well, so, <coughs> so I said I'm um, generally very skeptical. Mm -hmm. The you know one of the weird things about building standards is it's kind of painful, boring work, and what you do is sign up and say, "Yes, I would like more of that pain than other people," um, because I'm not getting enough in my daily life. But actually, that's about the only way I know of keeping you know. The, the, the rubbish quotient down a bit, so that doesn't solve the entire problem. But as soon as you set up incentives for people to to do stuff, you know, this is like building bureaucracies. Yeah, you, you don't want to build like a just monetary approach or mechanism to to help that. My thoughts on it are that that's where a really solid and healthy community ecosystem can can come into play. And so, you know, you want to, unless an organization is willing to say, put um, Brian from Microsoft in a position that allows him to spend 40% of his time editing a spec, um, and, and that, that happens with, with particularly useful or important specs, you know, the bigger companies will step up and, and pay for the resources to do that. But in, in a case where maybe the features or the um, technologies are less business critical, you don't have as many companies willing up to willing to step up and, and give that investment. So the community needs to fill the gap where, and I believe people should be paid for their labor, but uh, Open Collective and Patreon and those things aren't going to really pay anybody's salary to get, get shit done. Um, if there are um, uh, other kinds of um, community events, um, community spaces where people can be celebrated, recognized, and um, also, I think in many cases, um, they, they need to kind of get, to have a little bit of that um, credit given and, and a little bit of that like deferment, like, oh, we thank you, Nick, for all the time that you've been spending, we're going to kind of like defer a bit to your expertise because you've been owning this process for a long time. Like that means a lot to people um, in an open source uh, community where a lot of times you get a lot of the sh you get shit on when you're a maintainer. Um, and and, and really thinking. Yeah. Well, no, 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 no,
thank you, yeah, you know, for the time that you've spent. And, thank you. Yeah. And, and of course, it's, it's worth remembering that the reward for doing the job is usually more work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but one of the things I have seen, I mean, one of the things I think does make sense is that if you find people are doing good work, not only do you go around and thank them, but slip them a quick 50 or you know, pay, for their, <laughs> pay for their airfares or give them Buy a free... Buy them a drink, you yeah. know, yeah. No, seriously, I mean, you know, yeah. things, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. airfares to mediums. Right. 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 But it makes a huge difference. But it should be... You know, based on the fact that you stepped up and did stuff and we like what you did, rather than, you know, or you put stuff up on offer, but it's like, this is a one-time thing, you get one shot at it, but if you don't like what you did, you're never getting any more. And, well, I think um, the Ethereum Foundation or, or the Open Projects Group could, could do something here, where so, it's like... So the thing is, I've seen EF do this, I've also seen people walk away well, and discuss... I have discuss. my sentence, so let me Sorry. finish. Uh, yeah. So I think one of the things that they could do is like, you know, maybe provide a... Um, a, a thank you gift. I mean, I did this for all of my maintainers at the JS Foundation. I gave everybody a thank you card and a shirt and some stickers that was like heartfelt. Like, I appreciate the shit that you put up with. Um, and, and then to your point, Dan, like, if you can afford it, bringing them, paying for their airfare to come to a, a, a community event or having a special event just for them at a DevCon, for example, it's not expensive to say, we're going to have a lunch, you know, to thank you for your time, and you can kind of come and kibitz with your, your colleagues in the space. And those are just some, like, little things that I think but, make a difference. So what I was on was, one of the things I have seen in, in Ethereum is people watch, you know, people do a bunch of work, they see some of the people get rewarded, and they don't get what they think is their reward, and they storm off and don't do shit. And, and I've seen that not only in Ethereum, I've seen it in other places. It's like, you alienate people who are doing hard work by rewarding other people and, and a perception of injustice. And, and the problem is, it's really difficult not to do that, right? Because you don't know what people think they should be entitled to. So if you start setting up entitlements, then it, it gets messy fast. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I guess part of the thing is, Encouraging people to recognize, you know, that basically the whole point of doing this is we have a really shit job, which you probably won't get thanked for properly, and you should expect it to be painful and miserable, um, rather than setting up the thing of, well, you know, you will get, like, rewarded and you'll get authority. Probably, if you do good stuff, you will, in fact, and you certainly should, but but when people come with that expectation, you can really upset them in a way that if they come with this sort of, someone's going to do the work, then you're, you're often in a better place. Good question, I like that. Yeah. Um, hey, Nick, is it? Yeah. Um, question to you, how do you prevent silos across the working groups that you mentioned, for example, wallets and other groups? What's the mechanism to keep those separate entities aligned? So at the moment, the, the working groups are still very early. Um, they, they haven't taken over sort of responsibility for their areas the way I would like them to do. Um, and so I think their, their internal and, and communication between working groups is, is fairly ill defined as well. I was, I was quite closely involved in the formation of the theory magicians. I was at the first two. I, I chaired the first meeting, but since then I moved to New Zealand, and it became a lot harder to make it to the meetings. Um, so I'm quite out of date on where they're up to now. So I'm probably not the best person to answer, unfortunately. Yeah, eight had participants always get screwed on conference calls. Yeah, and, and well, it's been it's been physical meetings mostly. You know, the, the, the first two I made it to, and then after that it was just literally the other side of the world. So. Sorry. Uh, Which is literally outside of the world from New Zealand. Show me in New Zealand. It's a lovely place. It, it is, but I know, you know, I wouldn't wish that travel on anyone. I've done it myself far too many times. But do visit, it's a lovely place. <laughs> <laughs> Brought to you by the New Zealand tourism. <laughs> 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 yeah, but there's one thing when you get here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so, so W3C sort of looks at that problem seriously and has done for 20 odd years and the answer is it's 
kind of in ad hoc. You, uh, if, if you bear in mind that this is an important problem that you need to keep addressing, then you, know, you keep remembering that you should have done it and you do a bit of it. Uh, and as Dan said, they, W3C has what they call these horizontal review groups. So they're groups looking at accessibility, privacy, architectural consistency, which is a really you know, interesting thing to hope for on the web where there is none. Um, uh, security, internationalization, security. And, and those groups get kind of, uh, because they look at all of the different bits of work for the thing they're looking at, quite often in those groups you find people who say, hey, wait a minute, like this thing and this thing look the same. And, and it's one of those people who says, hey, you guys should be like, you know, not doing this two different ways that are the same thing. We thought about talking to each other. Um, but W3C also has, because it has a formal decision making point, it's like at, at the end of it, one of the things that, that people can object to is just like, well, why are we you know, reinventing this wheel that we already made a square one last week? What's, what's with this hexagonal one? We shouldn't do that. And so if an objection like that comes up, basically, get taught to go and think harder about it. And it may be that the answer is, yeah, turns out no one liked that square wheel. We're going to triangle once. Um, but it's, it's still a bit ad hoc. It's still like, the you know, process doesn't get work done. Thanks for calling. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.